Good morning everyone, Suzanne Johnson here. We've just got a few minutes to go until midday. You are in the right place if you're here for the webinar on the, from the MSD Symposium series. Welcome and um, you've just got a couple of minutes to finish off those things you need to do and then sit back and relax. Welcome everyone to the third of the um, MSD Symposium on-call webinar series. We're very excited to have you here today and if you've been listening through the series, welcome back. If you're new, glad to have you here today. My name's Suzanne Johnson. I'm the manager of the ergonomics unit here at Workplace Health and Safety Queensland and today's facilitator. Um, the Workplace Health and Safety Queensland have been running this Encore series to following on from a really successful event last year, our MSD Symposium. We created this series based on some of our popular presentations and workshops from the day so we could reach a broader audience. So to make sure you are in the right place today, it's, this webinar is about measuring for success, performance indicators and executive reporting. I will get in early by just explaining that this is not about technical managing MSDs. Stay tuned for that next week. Today is really covering off on what we see as some of the critical enablers and barriers to preventing MSDs in the workplace. 
Um, some of the presentations we've had have been on that much more broader element around the critical sort of stages in safety management systems. Um, you would have seen the previous sessions on leadership and engaging and communicating. So you'd all appreciate that to have a robust system, you need some not only excellent sources, resources and tools, but also measuring the right KPIs. We may not be driving the right safety outcomes without that. So hence for today. After today, we do have one more webinar next week and it's about MSD prevention and risk management. So you can still register on the website, please go ahead and do that onto the events page and I would encourage you to share that broadly or through your colleagues and your supply chain. Today is going to be um, about 45 minutes and we are recording it so don't be alarmed if you do have to step away or um, for some reason can't listen to the whole event, we will have that up on the website. We're planning, um, Karen's going to talk for about 30 minutes, present to us, and then we'll be following up with a short Q&A sort of session. And on that, if you do have any questions, you'll see in the, on the um, computer on the screen there that you've got a little chat box um, and there's a section that says send to. P please click on all panellists and you can chat in your question there and I'll see that um, and be able to ask Karen that question as well. We'll try and get through as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation, but if we don't, we will ask Karen for some feedback and put some commentary on the website when we have the webinars uploaded. So with um, no further ado, I, I'm pleased to invite Karen to start talking to us just to let you know that we're very fortunate that we've had a number of presenters that have kindly made themselves available to present to us. We're very thankful. Karen has quite a, a credentialed um, bio here but I have amended it quite briefly so we can allow as much time for her to present. Karen's an executive officer for the CEO to the CEO of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, otherwise known as ANSTO. She has many years of experience, over 25 in work health and safety, to ensure compliance and, and to identify and establish best practice safety. I'm going to hand over to Karen now and welcome Karen. Thanks very much Suzanne, I hope everybody can hear me and thank you everybody for taking time out of your very busy days to uh, share your lunch with me and hopefully you are sharing your lunch. I'd like to start off by saying that I'm actually not here to tell you how to do your job. I, I always find it very annoying when people um, talk and make out like you don't know what you're doing. What I really want to share with you is my journey of discovery that starting back from my very early days when I used to fudge an LTIFR when, when the executive said to me make it smaller, make it smaller and I'd give a call to HR and said say, surely we've had some staff leave so we can have a shorter, a smaller LTIFR um, to, to where I've come to now and the thinking that's gone on to drive where I'm located. We have not picked an easy job to do. We must have an eye to the future of work and the potential impact on work health and safety. We've got to look at technology, we've got to look at our workplace, we've got to look down the supply chain. If we take William Tell as an example, he was, he was a master of the longbow. He knew exactly what he was doing. His target was shoot apples off heads, don't kill persons. He trained all the people and fitted all the all the, uh, the rest of the organisation out with longbows, they were all experts on what they had to do. And then the future of work happened and the crossbow was invented and it was new technology, it was the changing world. So from a work health safety uh, perspective, they had to look across the organisation for the impacts of the change. Is it going to work as well as the old longbow? How long before everybody can be accommodated either with the new technology or the training and the expertise needed to drive the new technology? And what new training is actually required? Can you apply your old skills or do you need to go right back to first principles? And what about the psychosocial effects on people who were, were expert at what they did to have to go right back to being a novice and learn those skills all over again? 
The next thing to, to make sure happens with this is the business integration of work health and safety into all aspects of the business process, as well as considering the total work health with the integration of safety and health into the DNA of the job design. So is it going to create um, angst for the fingers? Are we going to have new muscular skeletal disease because it's going to be sitting on shoulders and there's going to be recoil? What's all the issues that has to be considered by introducing a crossbow instead of a longbow? And success for us is measured in people's lives or well-being. So how do we tell decision makers how things are going? On the other hand, how do we know when we are doing well? It's fairly easy for us to identify when something has gone horribly wrong, but how can we identify what actions are actually making a difference for us? This is what's actually exercised my brain for over the past 15 years. Some of you might want to leave right now because the key message that I want to deliver today is that you actually can't get your measures out of a textbook. And what works for one organisation is actually not guaranteed to work for you. The secret to how you measure for success is actually in the questions you ask. So what is your objective? What, what do you actually want to improve? Who are you going to be giving the information for? Because the measure that you provide them needs to meet their needs for the decisions they need to make. What are you actually assessing and what change do you want to see? What activities are going to influence this so you can actually see if you're making a difference or are you just going to be shooting in the breeze? Then you've got to actually measure and evaluate against all these things and then you start all over again because hopefully you've seen a change and you're going to put in place an improvement. So actually, are we a science? The scientific knowledge that can be used to prevent work-related fatality, injury, disease and ill health is often well known long before it is seriously applied. We all know the impact of gravity on the body and we all know the injury over time um, of continuous and repeated movement. The time has passed when prevention of work-related injury and ill health can be considered a matter of common sense. When we ignore or don't clearly understand the scientific basis of work health and safety, work health and safety practice defaults to a superficial common sense or flavour of the month year approach. So if safety is a science, then we, people working in safety, are scientists. And Dr Google says that a scientist is a person engaging in a systematic activity to acquire knowledge that describes and predicts the natural world or one who uses the scientific method. And by scientific method, it is that you make observations, you think of interesting questions, you formulate hypotheses, you develop testable predictions, you gather data to test those predictions, then you maybe refine, alter, expand, or reject your hypothesis, and then you develop a general theory and move forward. Well, I say we are scientists. We just haven't lent into this aspect of our work enough. Our way of measuring performance and testing activities has actually been developed outside of our discipline and mainly by the accounting and insurance world where the goal has been subtly different to ours. And I think we need to rectify this. The quote that you are seeing on the, on the board there is that it's from Anne Rowe. And Anne Rowe was an American clinical psychologist and a researcher who studied creativity and occupational psychology. So it seemed to me appropriate that she sets the tone for the discussion today. And she said a good part of the trick to being a first-rate scientist is in asking the right questions or asking them in ways that make it possible to find answers. It is in asking, it is in the asking of these questions that we can discover what we should be measuring in our workplaces. The importance of identifying how best to measure performance in safety was driven home to me at a conference I attended in 2008. At that conference, there were AMP Alpha investors who spoke about how they looked at a company's safety performance in making decisions on when, whether to invest. They found that companies that performed well on safety outrode the global financial um, crisis in 2007. And from that point onwards, 
I became really interested in looking at how to use measurement and reporting to reflect success in safety. My initial conviction that safety could be used to indicate the overall health of the company was confirmed in an article in the Harvard Business Review by Michael Malbotten. He referenced a study by accounting professors Christopher Itner and David Larker who found that companies that bothered to measure a non-financial factor like safety and to verify that it had some real effect earned returns on equity that were about 1.5 times greater than those of companies that didn't take those steps. My need to understand how to apply measures that would indicate any difference my efforts were making in safety, as well as integrating into the organisation's business model, led me into an unholy alliance with, of all people, an accountant. Dr Sharon O'Neill and I embarked on a voyage of discovery to bring the discipline of accounting measures to the world of safety. And this voyage of discovery is the foundation for this presentation. Performance KPIs for safety are a form of business intelligence that provides information to inform decisions. Financial and organisational objectives and processes can actually influence work health and safety. So it is important that safety is integrated into the business model and thinking. However, it is important to realise that there is a difference in the role that executives and boards play and the role that management plays. Boards are there to set the strategic direction and manage business risk. They need work health and safety information that will pro provide assurance that risks are being managed and appropriate resources are available. Managers, on the other hand, manage the day-to-day -day business operations. They need work health and safety information that indicates how they are performing at the local level. The reports are not the same, and nor should they be, as the decisions that are required to be made are actually different. So the phrase that's up on the screen at the moment is a phrase that I think most people are familiar with. This is the earliest instance that I could find of the phrase in, that was printed in 1891 in a letter to the editor of the British newspaper, The National Observer, commenting on national pensions, though Mark Twain has also used this to great effect. So it says, so it has been wittily remarked that there are three kinds of falsehood. The first is a fib, the second is a downright lie, and the third and most aggravated is statistics. So to take your reporting from just being a statistic to a meaningful measure, you have to be very clear on what your objective is in doing the measure and what you want to change. Once you get your measure, you need to understand what the data is telling you, otherwise, the wrong actions can be taken. I've taken advice along the way from the very best and I would like to share with you a statement by Professor Dennis Elf. He said the whole performance measurement area is about trying to get people to think in terms of moving it from just data through to information, from information up to knowledge and then up to wisdom. That is, how do you get individual data items and data sets to the point where they can actually inform wise decisions. Also, there's the other corollary to that, which is we don't really want to go collecting data unless there's some decision point at the end of it. What's the point of burdening our businesses with more and more things to measure unless you can actually show how that information can be used to decide something? Our role is to identify what to report, who to report it to, and why. I think our first challenge is to actually understand where our organisations are at. There is no point in suggesting anything like a qualitative measure if your organisation is just focusing on the absence of injuries and the cost of them. If all they think of is in terms of lost, to, lost time injuries, to come out and say, hey, let's do a safety culture survey to check if everyone thinks we have a just culture embedded. I'm thinking that that won't work. A useful way to approach this challenge is think of where your organisation actually sits on the maturity model. Patrick Hudson has suggested a five-level maturity model, but there have been many suggestions over the time of using a three-level model. Personally, I like three. I think five is greater than academic model with subtle nuances, but I'm a practical person. Um, I work with practical people, so I like to think of it in terms of I'm no good, 
I'm getting better, I'm great with a continuous improvement agenda. Five or three, I think this will help you to understand where your organisation's thinking is at. And remember that this is not a reflection of you, but it does provide an understanding of the challenge that you will face. Then our challenge as safety professionals is to identify where we want the organisation to head and then come up with performance indicators that will help them move in the direction that we want. When setting up your KPIs, you need to think through who needs the data and what decisions they will be making based on the data. This will frame what you will report. The KPIs should help you understand what is happening and should be able to be measured. What is important to measure, you need to make easy to measure. Otherwise, your KPIs will be the ones you can get, not the ones you want. And what a waste of time that is. Lost time injury rates have an undeserved reputation as being a useful measure to compare with other organisations. The reality is that they do not give an indication of a fatality, as shown in the study by Salonami and Askinen in 1998. Lost time injuries reflect high frequency, low consequence events that provide little insight into disabling injury or illness. Andrew Hopkins, may we all worship at his feet, has said about lost time injuries. They are, at best, a measure of how well a company is managing minor hazards. They tell us nothing about how well major hazards are being managed. Moreover, firms normally attend to what is being measured at the expense of what is not. Thus, a focus on lost time injuries can lead companies to become complacent about their management of major hazards. As a consequence of focusing on relatively minor matters, the need for vigilance in relation to catastrophic events has been overlooked. Clearly, the lost time injury rate is the wrong measure of safety in any industry which faces major hazards. We would all be aware of the fine lost time injury measures that preceded some of the catastrophic events that have occurred in the past, a point in cases Deepwater Horizon. I would also suggest that it can lead companies to also overlook the catastrophic nature of musculoskeletal diseases as I have found in the past in my own experience and I will expand on later in my presentation. However, it may be prudent to keep reporting what is expected. It is a good idea to lean into what is already being measured and then add in the performance indicators that will drive improvement. If lost time injuries are expected, then it may be easier to keep them and introduce others to replace them over time. You go same, same, a little bit different, different. A point in case that I'd like to um, share with you is my daughter when she was younger hated broccoli, but she happily ate green carrots for a number of years before she actually realised the truth. KPIs should be informing across different levels of the organisation how effective the controls are in place to manage the risk to health and safety. There are broadly three types of controls. There's the technical controls, the cultural controls, and governance. And these come together to underpin effective management of work health and safety by ensuring hazard identification and risk management is in place at the operational level for workers and supervisors, leadership with a robust safety culture for the organisation, and effective oversight and control at the executive and board level. Identifying potential hazards and risks can come from many sources, and these may identify some areas that should be measured. Hazards can be measured proactively or reactively. Ideally, you use a combination of both. To go about identifying hazards proactively, you can look for risks that your organisation already knows about and has identified in the risk register, you may have identified them through audits and inspections, or you may look at what has occurred in other organisations and apply that knowledge in your own organisation. Sometimes hazards are identified the hard way, after an illness or injury. Identifying hazards reactively may be through injuries and illness, through a review of investigation reports to gain information on uncontrolled risk, or lessons learned from regulatory activities whether that be investigations, prosecutions, or fines. 
What you're seeing on the screen at the moment is uh, a bank of hot cells in our boutique radio pharmaceutical production area. Now, we had years ago long-term manual handling uh, fine motor skill injury uh, coming from this work. You can see that the operator was required to look through a tiny lead glass window. They have to do remote handling through the manipulators, which is the long arms that the people are holding. Now, these cells were constructed um, probably 50 to 60 years ago, back in the days when nobody thought of ergonomics and uh, it pretty much was a stock standard size workforce. So what we had with this manufacturing area was an area where to see in the window you had to scrunch up your shoulders to use the manipulators or to hold the manipulators properly you couldn't actually see in the window. And we had a historical set of injuries around shoulder and wrist injuries. And it was virtually invisible when I commenced with the organisation because they didn't go off on the workers' compensation, we brought them back into other jobs, but we had this rotation where we get new workers in and after about three to five years, they would be at the point where they could no longer work in that role and they'd be given another, another job. This was invisible, just using LTI reports. Our executive were ignorant of what was going on and nobody could get visibility on the catastrophic nature of what we were doing to staff members. So, my team and I introduced a new report and we focused on restricted duty because that was something that was not commented on. The number of people that were on restricted duty or had actually been moved permanently to different roles. And all of a sudden the executive was seeing a totally different view of the workforce and view of what was going on in the area. And that led to a whole lot of questions um, about what was going on, why was it happening, what came out of that was an improved maintenance on equipment. There were new, bigger lead cell windows put in to, so that there was um, greater visibility and people didn't need to scrunch to see through the windows. There was a huge capital spend to get new equipment and to get some um, mechanising of the processes in there so it didn't actually require the same number of um, manipulations to do it. And a preventive health program was introduced that um, provided um, exercises through a, an exercise physiologist and gym exercises and a daily program of gym to build up resilience and, and strengthening. And we also introduced a process of immediate reporting of any nickel that people got so that there could be immediate action on what was happening. And what we found with this, it pretty much made the whole issue that we were experiencing around manual handling issues disappear from this area. Using the traditional approach to classification of injuries has a number of limitations as well. Lost time injuries lump high frequency and low consequence events in with low frequency and high consequence events. And that restricts your knowledge of how you are progressing with injury prevention. Using the approach, using this, this approach, the focus is on the frequency of the, the occurrence, that is how many are happening rather than the consequence of the occurrence, how bad it is. And it doesn't recognise impairments that may not involve lost time but result in long-term damage, things like hearing loss. This was certainly my experience in our production area. An alternative approach to classifying injury and illness is by severity. This provides a far greater validity and reliability in the measurement of both the financial and human injury and illness cost. What you get from this is improved information to inform your organisational work health and safety strategy. The severity classifications focus on the consequence of the illness and injury from the perspective of the injured person rather than the employer organisation. Impairment is therefore a reflection of the time until a full recovery is achieved and whether a full recovery is achieved rather than simply time taken to return to work. The severity categories draw attention to high consequence class one rather than the low consequence class two and three events. This work has been a real aha moment for me and I am really indebted to the thinking that's been provided by Jeff McDonald and the work he did on this. 
for those who are located in Queensland, you might be interested to know that Jeff was actually a Queensland boy and he was the first uh, recipient of the Safety Institute of Australia's um, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. As I stated, there's a real danger in focusing on highly aggregated lost time injury or recordable injury rates when monitoring Ill injury and illness performance. Because the number of low consequence injuries, ooh, I've got another paper cut, tends to far exceed the number of high consequence injuries, ooh, I've actually chopped off my hand, changes in fatal and permanently disabling outcomes are relatively insignificant components of lost time injury and are therefore rendered oops, statistically invisible. An analysis that was done by Dr O'Neill of state-based workers' compensation data for the 10-year period 1992 to 2001 was undertaken. It looked at approximately 408,500 workplace injuries and it showed a downward improving trend in total lost time injury rates, which is absolutely great. Um, and you can see that on the, the left-hand side graph. However, when an impairment analysis was done on the same data, it showed a rising incidence of permanently disabling injuries. Now, this, this goes in some way to explaining why when lost time injury rates seem to be coming down, workers' compensation um, costs are still increasing because we've got hidden data that people aren't seeing. And this is actually an important message when you are looking at musculoskeletal disease where the potential for ongoing disability is very, very high. Using the approach of classifying injury and illness by severity, you can start to allocate your investigation resources in a more strategic way that is aligned with the impact or the potential impact of the incident. None of us, unfortunately, have unlimited resources and it is important that we know where to focus our efforts to actually make the most impact. A change of approach can also lead to an improved focus on control to prevent any further injuries or illness where it is most needed. So having improved the quality of the reporting based on everything we've discussed, you need to ask yourself, is your method of reporting making the impact you hoped for? So on the screen you can see a table and it's got a lot of really good information on it but if you look at it like this, back 11, fingers 5, shoulder 3, arm 3, leg 3, head 3, chest 2, hand 2, psychological 2, knee 2, hello is anybody still awake? Did you actually notice how I slipped in the psychological injury into that table as well? How do you actually make this become real for the people who need to make the decisions to allocate your resources in the right way. So if you want to get attention from decision makers, you need to make it real for them. You need to make it pop from the page. And this, this uh, way of putting it on the screen uh, that you can see aligns the reporting with a severity-based classification and puts it as a picture. Suddenly the injuries pop and a dialogue commences. I have to acknowledge the work of Kurt Warren for the, the little person. He was the one who first introduced me to the concept of putting all the injuries on a person. So all of a sudden you can see straight away, the executives can see straight away, why are we having hand injuries? I didn't realise we're having hand injuries. What on earth does it mean to have an injury on the head? What are we talking about there? Um, and the work of the, the classification um, by severity has, is uh, a lot of work being done by Maria Pryor. And so executives can see straight away, why am I reading class one? What on earth is going on? What, do I, what conversation do I need to have about with you about what's going on there? The next thing to think about is, are your KPIs lead or lag? Now, Dr. O'Neill says that it's all in the timing. It can be lead or lag, depending on when you are measuring. For example, if we're measuring training, training conducted is a lead indicator and the effectiveness is a lag indicator. However, have, if there's been an incident, training effectiveness would then become a lead indicator and the injury is a lag indicator. 
Now this way of thinking has really done my head in. It's accountant speak. However, it's important for us to start thinking in the terms of the business if we want to be understood and have impact with the decision makers and purse string holders in the organisation, we need to understand how they're taking our message and we need to put our message in a way that they're actually going to understand and have an impact with them. A useful way to think of this is to consider lead indicators as the useful aspects of the implementation of the control process. Um, control process. Lag indicators reflect the outputs or the outcomes of the process and provide information on the effectiveness of the control. An example of this would be consultation. The number of staff consulted is a lead indicator as it gives us information about the implementation of the consultation. The number of staff suggestions we adopt is a lag indicator as it gives information about how effective the consultation was. Identifying KPIs in this way can also be useful for integrating and indicating organisational responsibility for work health and safety and the consequence of decisions made across the organisation. You can highlight the impact of human resourcing decisions by looking at rosters that identify safe staffing levels and the number of shifts operating below these levels. The impact of procurement decisions can be highlighted by looking at the percentage of contracts stating work health and safety criteria and the percentage of contracts meeting the cost versus work health safety criteria. It is important for us as safety professionals that we talk the language of the business. Most business risks are managed using one of four strategies, avoid, reduce, transfer or accept. Work health and safety risk is different there are legal requirements that mean two considerations distinguish our risk management from the practices used to manage other forms of business risk. First, the choice of strategy available for controlling work health and safety risk is limited by law. Second, the role that cost-benefit analysis plays in decision-making processes is significantly reduced in our world. So if we look at the four strategies used by business to manage risk and apply it to the world we know, avoid we actually like that because that equates to level one of the hierarchy of controls. Reduce, we like that one too. That equates to level two and level three of the hierarchy of controls. Transfer, for us it is actually not possible to transfer a work health and safety risk and accept that is so not possible, particularly depending on the consequences of that risk. How far do we take it? This will depend on where the organisation is at on the maturity scale. Or your risk profile may be telling you that you need to expand the scope of your reporting. For example, psychosocial might be a big thing for you. The supply chain, uh, particularly if you're working across the country and across businesses, might be something you need to think about. Organisational decisions might be the area that's having the biggest impact on the work health safety. The factors you need to consider depends on your organisation and where it operates. Do you have national or international consideration that brings with it variations in legislation and standards? What industry factors do you need to consider? What's your sector profile? What's the nature of the work? And what's the risk that it brings? Then there are your organisational factors. The maturity level of your people and your management, the organisational infrastructure, your resources, I think I said it before, there never really are enough of them, and your structure. The number of KPIs you require will change as you move through your organisation too. There will be more KPIs at the operational level. Remember, different roles require different information. To be useful, a KPI needs to have certain attributes. It needs to be robust and well chosen to inform the effective design and management of safe and healthy work. You need the right tool. Don't rely on generic work health and safety indicators. I am afraid to say that you can't be like the lady in the cafe in when Harry met Sally and say, I'll have what they're having. Another organisation's maturity level may not be yours. 
their industry may be different. I would say weigh the desire for benchmarking against your need to have KPIs that are useful for informing sound work health and safety strategy and practices in your organisation. Consultation is essential, and not just because the legislation tells us to do it. If you understand the use and likely impact of the KPI, you will ensure that the KPIs you adopt are both relevant and valid. Finally, you need to provide scope for continuous improvement of the quality of evidence relating to both work health and safety position and performance. It is our role to take our organisation on a journey, whether they want it or not. So I would suggest it all starts with the right question. What knowledge do I need? What controls need to be in place? What will drive performance? How do I know that it is actually working? I started my quest many years ago with a question. How can I measure my success in making my workplace safe? My talk has taken you through my journey to find the answer. The new questions I have asked myself and the wonderful brains that have provided me some answers. I let a scientist open my talk and it seems appropriate to let a scientist have the last word. Albert Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would use the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. Thank you very much for your time. Wow, well, Karen, I think evidenced by the people that all stayed, we didn't lose anyone through that, so it's gripping information, and who would have thought measuring and KPIs would keep us all so transfixed? Um, we've got a bit of time, just a few minutes for questions. Um, thanks again, Karen. Well, I do have a couple of questions. I guess one came through um, just around the body map pictures and whether they can be attained. We do have hotspot data on our website, but it might be an interesting um, job to get up as a designed or I'm not sure what program you use in, in de delivering that um, information, but it might be something that our department um, can do. Is there any... Sure, Suzanne. Look, I, what, what I'll do is um, we, we can talk offline about this. And like I said, Kurt Warren came up with the concept, but Maria Pryor, who, who is in my organisation, has, um, has uh, adapted that. And I can uh, talk with Maria and uh, we can have a conversation about making that available to other people. That would be great. We do, and I would say to anyone, we do have some great figured hotspot data on our website and harm related data. So it's certainly something that um, resonates. Um, another question, I guess, was you mentioned um, having very meaningful measures. Uh, and, and I'm aware that um, a lot of large organisations, they'll, they'll have measures required or they'll look at measures of their subcontractors and their supply chain around awarding contracts. Mm. I just wonder if you can comment on, you know, a recommendation to those organisations around what would be better generic uh, measures. This, a lot of them do use LTI, um, FR as, you know, that, that measure. Is, is that something? Yeah, sure, sure. I'm, I'm happy happy to comment on that. And you know, I sort of say this is this is my take on the world, everybody. So just be aware of that. Um, L LTI and LTIFR is is so firmly ingrained into the safety DNA that it it's really difficult to um, to get out. And I know that there's a lot of contracts that rely very heavily on that. But if if I had the world to rescope, the kind of things that I would be really interested if, in getting a subcontractor to tell me about is, you know, understanding their high risk activities. You know, do they actually have an understanding of their high risk risk activities? And um, you know, what um, what's their incidence by consequence? I'd, I'd really like to understand that. And uh, I'm also interested in how proactive they are. Are they meaningful about closing out their actions? Um, Tripper is one that would I think is better to be looking at instead of an LTIFR. But Tripper focusing on the number of fatal injuries and illnesses and the high consequence non-fatal injuries, um, so that you start to understand what their profile is around that. Um, also, the when we're talking about investigations, they how fast they close these investigations out. So do they let things linger? Are they very proactive? Um, 
and I spoke about doing the business risk. So um, the, the other thing that we're sort of um, playing with, I'm playing with across our organisation and I think this is quite telling as well, is looking at your actions and breaking them down according to the hierarchy of control. So where are you actually putting your investigations? You know, so what, what kind of um, activity are they doing around these high consequence events that they're having? You know, is it all coming down to just training or they're actually making um, class one um, changes and controls being put in place. But these are some of the things that I would um, I would like to see. I, I think would be a more meaningful dialogue back to companies to understand who you're inviting in to do your business with. Absolutely, music music to our ears. Um, I guess another one that's come through is is interested to know um, what what's Ansto? Do you, do you have any? I guess constants that you stick by? You mentioned about, you know, driving certain measures. Mm. Um, I guess from from your own organisation, is there any ones that just always should be there? Look look for us, um, we're a we're a um, radiation is probably our big high risk activity. We will we will never go away from reporting on radiation. Um, at our radiation events, we want to know everything that happens in that area. So we're quite meticulous in gathering all that information. Uh, we also want to look at dose exposure, so we would never we would never go back from not looking at those. Um, the other things that we uh, that we're looking at is um, events uh, like incidents. We look at our incident reports, who's reporting. We like to see, and we break that down across the, the business divisions so that we can see what's happening in, in that area. We like to also look at the classification of those events that they're reporting and we're actually starting to classify against consequence and, and potential, um, not just against you know what actually happened. So some, something that might not have actually resulted in an injury or even uh, a mechanical breakdown might actually get reported as uh, a moderate or severe based on the potential consequence that could have happened. I don't think we'll ever, ever um, detract from, from doing those. And the other thing that we're very strong on doing is our operational events so that we understanding our process safety and what we're reporting against our, um, our equipment and, our, uh, and how that works. Thanks, Karen. Someone's actually typed in just to ask a little bit more. For those not familiar with TRIFA, if you can just explain that a little bit more and expand. Oh, okay. So, so TRIFA is the, the total recordable injury rate. So it's it's um, it's everything. It's sort of like your fatalities, it's your injuries, it's your first aid. So it's, it's getting the full picture of what's going on, not just um, the lost time. And and look, I'll I'll, I'll just sort of I, I know I've sort of I think I might have mentioned I, I'm not actually in tune with lost time injuries during the course of my talk. I don't know if anybody picked up on that. But my my disenchantment with lost time injury started years and years ago when um, I was I was sort of trying to put our, our um, metrics together and we had an executive who were very keen to do benchmarking outside the organisation. And we've always had a very meticulous reporting culture where we would gather everything in and we, we'd have to be very across on what's gone on. And as, as I spoke to you, you know, we, we had uh, a lot of manual handling injuries occurring. We would report all those, didn't matter how, how serious they were, even if they were a niggle, we would actually record them as a, as a, as a potential injury for the person. And then I started to try to benchmark against organisations who would define lost time injury as, you know, um, one where they've been off for a week. And then another organisation defined them. Well, once we've got an accepted workers' compensation claim, we will call that a lost time injury. And and I'm I was going crazy, thinking, oh my god, I'm 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 benchmarking myself against people who who have got you know a, a very broad definition of how they're measuring um, their performance to what I was measuring. So uh, a tripper is, um, is 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 a much better way to do because you can actually pull all those together, so you actually start to get a a more cohesive measure that you can actually compare if that's really what you want to do. 
Great, thanks Karen. I'm mindful that we've, um, we've got some more questions coming in but we're also out of time. So what we will do is, um, I'm sure Karen will be happy to look at those offline and we'll put those, res those sort of responses for everyone to in, um, appreciate. So I've noticed people are having to head off um, off to their next activity. But look, Karen, that was fantastic. I, I've learnt more um, and a lot. Um, we, we, we're really grateful for you, the time and your busy schedule. And also, as you highlighted, thanks for people for joining us. This, this is really important information that we just so need to get out to, to as many people as possible. Um, if you do want to access more information on preventing and managing MSDs, please come and visit the website. Um, we've got lots of different ways you can access our information as well and any workshops and events that are coming up. We're really happy um, and keen to have feedback and for our reporting we need to report up and, and also um, you know, be able to support these sort of programs. So please hang on um, for 30 seconds and complete the little survey that is going to pop up on your webinar just when we um, say well. So thanks again Karen and everyone um, and we'll look forward to next week's webinar. My pleasure and thanks, thanks everybody for sharing your time with me.